welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio and our 2000th episode special. From Kalispell, Montana, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, 2,000 episodes is definitely a huge milestone. And I wanted to bring you a very special one-hour story. And we're going to take a look at one of the great classic mystery novels adapted for audio. Trent's last case was released originally in 1913. And it was written by E.C. Bentley. Ironically enough, it was the first book to feature amateur detective Philip Trant. What we're going to bring you today is an hour-long NBC University theater presentation of Trent's last case. And the original air date, July the 30th of 1950. is the NBC University Theater with another in our series of dramatizations based on outstanding works in Anglo-American literature. Today, Dan O'Herlihy stars in one of the most unusual novels in the field of detective fiction, E.C. Bentley's classic, Trent's Last Case. Trent's last case was first published in England in 1913, but it has been read and reread ever since and remains a distinctive classic in its field. Remember then, the time is some 65 years ago. The place is England, and our storyteller is Philip Trent, a brilliant painter who dabbles in solving crime mysteries as a special correspondent for the London Record. We hear Trent talking with his friend, Welby in his London club. I say, Trent, this is the most interesting thing in the papers, this uh, Petunia Garden murder. What do you make of it? Mm -hmm. I don't really know, Welby. Haven't been following it, I'm afraid. Mm. It's been a long while since you've solved one of these murder mysteries for the police. I'm afraid I've given all that up, old man. After all, I'm a painter, will be. Yes, but I can't understand how you can resist a new mystery like this. You must have solved dozens of these cases where the police have failed. I've had my last case, Welby. Philip Trent is through. That seems almost unbelievable. Whatever makes you say that? <laughs> what makes me say I'm through? My last case, that's what. The case of Sigby Manderson. What? Will you win on the Manderson affair, Trent? Yes. Tell me, Welby... How much do you remember of the Manderson thing? Well, now, uh, I recall that Manderson was a big American financier. Let's see. Yes. He was staying at his English estate. The body was found not far from the house. His, uh, his teeth were missing. And, oh, yes, there was a beautiful young widow, wasn't there? A widow? Oh, yes, indeed there was. Yes, the Mandersons were staying in their English estate, a place called White Gables near Marlston. It was June, I remember. The London record called and asked me to have a look. I dropped everything and took a train for Marston. I arrived there the morning after Manderson's body had been found on his lawn and went directly to the hotel. The very first thing that happened was quite odd because I met an old friend of mine on the veranda, an interesting old gentleman named Burton. Dear me, certainly it's delightful to meet you again, Trent, my boy. Why, this is a wonderful surprise. My old friend Couples, I can hardly believe it's you. Of course, I rather expected an affair of this sort would bring you here. Uh, naturally, you come about the murder. My dear couples, that's a rather colorless way of stating it, I must say. After all, I'm not just a correspondent. I am a specialist in criminal mystery. Oh, yes, 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 of course. And I'm sure you'll succeed brilliantly, my boy. Tell me, couples, what have you been up to since I saw you last? Oh, nothing very exciting happens to a retired old fellow like myself. I've been pattering about with my hobbies, doing a bit of research on this and that. Oh, I... 
I have had one rather stimulating experience at the British Museum Library. I've taken up the history of the Second Peloponnesian War, you know. Uh, that must be quite an adventure. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, oh well, enough of that. Uh, how are you getting on with the murder? Well, I've only just got here this morning. The first thing I must do is look the grounds over carefully, <laughs> if I can get on the right side of the people of the house. Yeah. And I believe I can be of assistance to you there, my boy. As a matter of fact, I've already arranged for you to have entree to the house with Mrs. Manderson, who happens to be my niece. Mrs. Manderson is your niece, Couples? Why, this is astounding. Oh, not really, no. Well, in that case, you can tell me a good deal I'd like to know. What kind of a person was Manderson? Was he a friend of yours? Yeah. I must say, Trent, this is a very painful subject to me. The truth is, I didn't like Manderson. And I don't believe anyone else in the world did either. Well, that's a bit startling. I thought he was a man of some charm. On the surface, yes. But you felt he'd, that he'd sacrifice anything or anyone to carry out his plan. Mm. I dare say that's why he was so fantastically successful in business, controlling the stock market, merging companies and that sort of thing. Yes, I suppose so. Of course, I very much disapproved of the way he used his industrial power to crush the weak. I refer especially to his ruthless conduct in that Pennsylvania coal strike some years ago. However, I had an even better reason for disliking him myself. For some time past, Manderson made my niece's life miserable. Well, just how do you mean, Couples? Well, first let me say this. My niece Mabel is like my own child to me, Trent. You see, I'm the only close relative she has, and, and I'd do anything to protect her. Yeah, yes, I believe she's a lovely person, Couples. Very lovely. Well... A few weeks ago, my niece wrote and asked me to come and see her. She told me that in recent months, Manderson had changed towards her, that he, that he seemed to nurse some perpetual grievance, become very distant, aloof. Did she have any explanation for this change? No, none whatsoever. She felt worried and humiliated and thoroughly miserable. Of course, I was distressed by her unhappiness, so I took action myself. I met Manderson here by the hotel one day, and I put the matter to him directly. How did he take it? Not very well. I'm afraid. He was perfectly calm and quiet, but I could tell he was angry. Mm -hmm. He looked at me and told me to mind my own affairs, but I didn't propose to be put off. In fact, uh, I rather lost my temper, I'm afraid. Made a number of foolish threats, loudly enough to be overheard by everyone about. Mm. Did Manderson say anything more? No, not a word. When I finished, he simply turned and walked off towards White Gables. His face was white with fury. Just when did this happen, Couples? Sunday morning. The Sunday morning before he was murdered. Then I don't suppose you saw him alive again? No. Oh, oh yes, come to think of it, I did. It was later in the day on the golf course, but I didn't speak to him on that occasion. Next morning, he was found dead. I say, Trent, I should think the old boy would be worried over being suspected himself. After that quarrel with Manderson, you know. Well, my old friend Couples is a very remarkable man, Welby. Very remarkable. But uh, to get on with it, I stopped at the coroner's for a look at the body, and then went out to White Gables. I was admitted readily enough, thanks to Couples, and there I met another old friend. Well, well, if it isn't Philip Trent, the demon investigator of the Daily Press. Well, well, again, if it isn't Inspector Murch, the bloodhound of Scotland Yard. <laughs> <laughs> I rather thought we'd meet again, Trent. Looks like the kind of case you like. What do you think about it? I'll tell you that after you tell me what you know about it. I'm sure you're the only one who has the facts straight. Mm. There aren't many facts this time, Trent. Or maybe there are too many that don't fit together. The night before last, Sunday night... Manderson went to bed at his usual time, about uh, half past eleven. The next morning, at ten o'clock, he was found on the lawn, a little way from the house, shot through the head. We searched thoroughly, but we couldn't find a thing. Oh, I suppose you've seen the body? Yes, I have. Then let me ask you uh, what you made of that. Well, uh, one thing struck me as peculiar. Mm -hmm. That Henry Manderson was very particular about his dress and appearance. Yes. Yet his shoes were loosely tied, and he hadn't put in his dental plate. Well, it would seem he got up and dressed in a hurry. 
Maybe he was wakened by robbers, chased them across the grounds, and got himself shot. Of course, he wasn't robbed, but they may have been scared off and run away. No, no, I noticed another thing. That Rawley was completely dressed, and his hair was carefully combed. A man setting off after burglars wouldn't go to all that trouble. Above all, he'd put in his dental plate first thing on rising. Mm. Mm. By the way, this, this room seems to be rather torn apart. What happened? Oh, we've been going through Manderson's papers. This is the library in the room Manderson used for his office. Uh, I'm afraid we didn't find anything. Who was the last to see Manderson alive, Merch? As far as we know, it was the butler, a man named Martin. <laughs> oh, good. There's nothing like having an English butler involved in these affairs. <laughs> I suppose you've heard a story, but uh, would you mind going through it again? No, no, something might turn up. I'll uh, ring for you. Thank you. Now, who else do we have in the house to suspect much? Well, there's uh, Mrs. Manderson, of course, the personal maid, usual servants, and Manderson's two secretaries. Two secretaries? Yes, Manderson had an American secretary named Bunner, Calvin Bunner, who looked after his business affairs mostly. Uh-huh. And he had an English secretary named Marlowe, who was more of his private secretary, I understand. They've both been with Manderson a good long time. Hmm. I see. Do you think... I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Did you ring for me? Yes, Martin. This is Mr. Trent. He's been authorized to go over the house and make inquiries. You would like to hear your story. Very well, sir. I last saw Mr. Manderson on Sunday night. No, no, not that yet, Martin. Tell me all you saw of him that evening. Everything after dinner, let's say. After dinner? Very well. After dinner, Mr. Manderson and Mr. Marlowe, his secretary, you know... We're walking out on the lawn. I believe they were discussing something important, for I heard Mr. Manderson say something as they came back in. I believe he said, if Harris is there, every minute is important. You should start right away and not a word to a soul. If Harris is there, every minute is important. You should start right away and not a word to a soul. Yes, sir. I heard this as they passed the open window of my pantry. And then Mr. Marlowe went upstairs, and Mr. Manderson rang for me from this room. He directed me to sit up and said that Mr. Marlowe had persuaded him to go for a drive in the car by moonlight. That certainly seems curious. I thought so too, sir. But I recalled what he said about not a word to a soul, and I concluded this about a moonlight drive was intended to mislead. That seems possible. What time was this? About ten, sir. Mr. Manderson waited until Mr. Marlowe came down and brought the car around to the front of the house... And then he went into the drawing room where Mrs. Manderson was. Did that strike you as unusual? Well, if you ask me, sir, I've known him to enter that room since we come to White Gables this year. However, Mr. Manderson returned in a few minutes, and he and Mr. Marlowe set off in the car in the direction of Southampton. But you saw Mr. Manderson again later? Yes, about an hour later, sir. He rang for me here in the library and said he wanted me to sit up until 12.30 in case an important message come by telephone. He said he'd sent Mr. Marlowe to Southampton in the car, and he therefore wanted me to stay up. He told me to take the message if he'd come and not to disturb him. You say that Mr. Manderson rang for you when he returned from his drive with Marlowe. Did you hear him when he re-entered the house? No, sir. But when I answered his ring, he was seated right over there with his hat still on, listening to the telephone. I would suppose that when he returned, he was in a hurry to use the telephone, and so he went straight across the lawn and came in by the French windows of the library. Oh, Could you tell by the expression on his face if he were angry or in a quarrelsome mood? Well, now, his back was to me, Mr. Trent. And he told you to wait up until 12.30 to answer the telephone. Did a message come? No, sir. I left and sat reading in my pantry until 12.30, but no message come. Was that the last you saw or heard of Mr. Manderson? No. A little later, about half past 11, I heard Mr. Manderson go upstairs to bed, and then after that I heard nothing more. Uh. As I understand it, after that, Mr. Manderson was not missed until the body was found at 10 o'clock the next morning. That is correct, sir. You see, Mr. and Mrs. Manderson had separate bedrooms, connected by a door that was left open at night. Now, in the morning, Mrs. Manderson was called at 7, and the maid took her tea into her. However, Mr. Manderson, he disliked having anyone fussing about, so we all suppose Mr. Manderson was still asleep in his room until we heard the shocking news, sir. There's one other point, Martin. When Mr. Manderson's body was found, was he wearing the clothes he would naturally have worn that day? Well, now, that reminds me, sir. I was most surprised when I set eyes on the body. First, I couldn't make out what seemed strange. And then I noticed the collar was of a style Mr. Manderson never wore, except with evening dress. Then I found he had on all of the things he had worn the night before, except a different suit and shoes. It was very unlike him. I suppose it shows he dressed in a great hurry when he got up. 
Perhaps so. <laughs> At any rate, thank you, Martin. You've put everything with admirable clarity. Now, would you mind sending Mrs. Manderson's maid to see me? Yes, of course, sir. I'll see to it at once, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Come now, Murch. I assure you, you're mistaken in suspecting that man. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't say anything about suspecting him. I haven't said a word. No, but I could see the handcuffs glinting in your eyes. Mm, I'll admit I don't like his manner. A bit too cool for me. But I'll say one thing for a story. Manderson did come in by the library window after leaving Marlowe in the car. There's a footprint in the soft gravel just outside the window. I found Manderson's patent leather shoes, the ones he wore Sunday night, in his bedroom cupboard. One of them matches the footprint exactly. <laughs> well, Murch, you have been the busy one, haven't you? Yes, but it hasn't helped much. Now, why would a man get up before the servants are awake, dress himself fully... Except for his dental plate, Murch. Then get murdered in sight of his house early enough to be cold and stiff by ten in the morning. I'm afraid no one can tell us just when Manderson was shot. Let's see if we can guess. Martin sat up until 12.30. So it was later than 12.30. On the other hand, he wasn't shot after people were awake or it would have been heard. Mm -hmm. Suppose we put that time at 6.30. Yes. So the crime could have taken place any time between 12.30 at night and 6.30 in the morning. That's right. But why would a late riser like Manderson be up and dressed before 6.30? Come in. Pardonnez-moi. You are Monsieur Trent? You sent for me? Why, uh, yeah, yes. Won't you sit down? Merci. I am called Celestine. Uh, I think I'll run along, Trent. I've already talked with Celestine. Very well, Inspector. I'll either be here on the grounds or at the hotel in the village. Let me know if you find out anything, will you? Certainly. So... You are Mrs. Manderson's maid. Oui, oui. I am so glad you have come, monsieur. The police officer is so, so brusque. But you, you seem more sympathetic. <laughs> I, I try to be. Now, when you took tea to Mrs. Manderson at seven o'clock yesterday morning, was the door to Mr. Manderson's adjoining room open? The door between the two rooms? Oh, oui. It was open as always. But as always, I closed it immediately when I entered Madame's room. Then you didn't see into Mr. Manderson's room. Ah, no, monsieur. It is the order. I see. So Mr. Manderson was supposed to be still in his room while Mrs. Manderson was getting up, dressing and having her breakfast. Oui, c'est ça, monsieur. Uh -huh. uh, I'm afraid that's all you can tell me then. Thank you. Ah, monsieur, I hope you catch the assassin of Monsieur Manderson. But for myself, I will tell you, I do not regret him too much. Really? Why do you tell me this, sir, Steve? You would find it out soon enough. Ah, no, alors. I do not regret him at all. Not at all. You make Madame so unhappy. Madame, who is so charming, so gentle, so adorable. He was so cold, so, how do you say, aloof, like a stone. Impossible. He had no sentiment, no feeling, no heart. He did not understand the woman. You're a, a very beautiful woman, Celestine. I dare say you're used to having your charms admired. Oh, eh bien, monsieur. I, uh, I wonder if Mr. Manderson did not take as much notice of you as, as you thought necessary and proper. I, I never gave it my regard. Very well. But a girl like you should be discreet. Monsieur Trent, I do not comprehend. Never mind. Perhaps you would show me to the rooms Mr. and Mrs. Manderson occupied? Certainly, monsieur. I trust we will not disturb Mrs. Manderson? Mais non, monsieur. Madame has moved from her room to another since Monsieur Manderson is departed. If you will come this way, monsieur. My word, Trenter. Can't make you think of it, old boy. <laughs> I'll admit I couldn't make much of it at first glance myself, will we? However, I went to Manderson's room and found the patent leather shoes Murch had mentioned. I measured them with the tape, hmm. and I took a closer look. You know, I, I'm a, a bit of a judge of good leather. I must say those were beautifully made shoes. But I noticed something. Each of the shoes had a tiny little rip just below the lacing. That set me to thinking. Yes, there must have been a struggle, of course. I went into Mrs. Manderson's room, and the first thing I noticed was a tall French window. I opened it, stepped out onto a little balcony with an iron railing that looked out over the lawn. 
It was then I, I, I felt I was getting somewhere. Mm. After that, I went to the hall. It went into a room across the passage. I knew it was Marlowe's room because there was a photograph on the mantel of Manderson and a, a handsome young English chap on some kind of a hunting trip. Marlowe was Manderson's social secretary, you know. Mm. There was another picture of Marlowe as a member of the Oxford University Dramatic Society. In fact, there were several poses of him impersonating various performers. Please, Trent, let's get on with the mystery, shall we? Uh, oh, very well, will we? There was a row of shoes here, too, which I measured. Then the next thing I found was more dramatic. A handsome leather case with a beautiful little revolver. I was just turning it over and noticing the initials, J.N., when I heard a step on the stairs and the door opened. I was just wondering what you were up to, Trent, and I thought... I say, whose revolver is that? It evidently belongs to the occupant of the room, Mr. Marlowe. Mm -hmm. It seems to have been clean since it was last used. Well, of course, I don't know much about firearms. Let me see it. I happen to know a good deal about them. Oh, yes, a specialty of yours, I believe. You don't have to be an expert to tell one thing. Take a look at this. Uh, some kind of bullet, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is that the one? Yes. The coroner just took it out of Madison's head this morning. It was fired from a revolver just like this one. Now, now, wait, Merch. This is all wrong. Marlowe's gun may have killed Manderson, but as I understand it, Manderson sent Marlowe to Southampton in the car Sunday night. That's right. And he didn't get back till Monday evening, long after the murder. Hey there. You mind if I come in? Huh? Yeah, oh, I didn't see you. Uh, what do you want? I, I want to see you if you're Mr. Trent. Celestine told me you were somewhere about here. Well, you gave us a bit of a start, Banner. Shouldn't sneak up on people that way in those tennis shoes. <laughs> I'm sorry, Captain. This is Calvin C. Bunner at your service, Mr. Trent. How do you do, Mr. Bunner? Hey, uh, what do you have there, Marlowe's revolver? Uh, yes, yes, uh, but the inspector tells me there are too many guns of this kind about to provide much of a clue. Oh, I suppose so. They're very popular back home in the States. I prefer to carry a slightly heavier gun myself. Do you know when Mr. Marlowe got this revolver? Why, uh, yes, just before we came here to White Gables from the States this year. Madison told him everyone should own a revolver, so he went out and bought the same kind Madison had. I suppose you knew Madison pretty well, Bunner. Do you have any ideas about all this? Well, yes. Just between us, I think the old man knew something was coming to him. Last few weeks, I, I never saw him so nervous and edgy. Why, he even neglected business. And I can tell you that never happened before. You mean, you, you think he was afraid of something? Uh, I couldn't be sure, but I, I think he knew someone was out to get him. I've heard that Manderson's manner became rather strange. What do you think he was afraid of? Oh, now, I understand. I'm just guessing, but a fellow like Manderson is bound to hurt a few people along the way, you know. Now, you take that Pennsylvania coal strike, for instance. Yes, yes, I remember that. I must say, I didn't admire Manderson's part in it. Well, maybe not, but it's business, Mr. Trent. After that, Manderson was bigger than ever. But there were 30,000 miners with wives and kids who would have liked a shot at him, I can tell you. I must say, Bunner, this is a new theory to me. You think there may have been a plot against him by a group of workers who hated him? Well, some of those fellows are pretty rough. That's all I know. That's certainly something to think about, Bunner. Oh. I, I believe I must get back to the village now, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk about it again. I say, Trent... Did you agree with that chap, Bunner? No, Welby, because I already had an idea of who did kill Manderson. Of course, there were still a few details to clear up. Seems to me the whole affair still needed to be cleared up. Well, the next morning I got up early to take a walk along the beach. It was a beautiful morning. As I stood on the cliff overlooking the sea, it became a morning I'll never forget. But there was a woman sitting there, looking out at the sea. She was dressed all in black, and her face was pale and drawn. She seemed as radiant, radiant as the morning itself. As I watched her there, she suddenly held up in the sky as if to greet the day with new hope. I can't tell you how I felt when I turned away and walked back to the hotel. My feelings were violently mixed. A little later, I set off with couples for White Gables. This was the day of the coroner's inquest, and he wanted to be with his niece during her ordeal. It was then that I met the lady in black for the first time. My uncle has told me all about you, Mr. Trent. I hope you will succeed in your mission here. I believe I will succeed, Mrs. Manderson. And when I've completed the case, I should like to lay the facts before you. I may need your advice before I publish them. 
My advice? Of course, if you wish. I'm very sorry to have to trouble you. You've been very kind in allowing me to look over the house and ask questions. But I, I'm afraid there are one or two things I must ask you directly. I'm sure it would be very foolish of me to refuse. Ask anything you like, Mr. Trent. Well, it's only this, Mrs. Benderson. Inspector Murch tells me your husband drew an unusually large sum of ready money from his London bankers and was keeping it here. Do you know why he should have done this? Why, no. In fact, I'm very much surprised to hear it. Why is it surprising, may I ask? Well, because I thought my husband had very little money in the house. On Sunday night, just before he went to join Mr. Marlowe at the car, he came into my drawing room and asked me if I had any money I could give him till the next day. That was unusual because he made it a rule to carry a good deal of money in his note case. I see. But he asked you for money that night? Yes. I had some in my desk and I gave him all that was there. About 30 pounds, I should say. Did he tell you why he wanted it? No. He put it in his pocket and then he said that Mr. Marlowe had persuaded him to go for a drive in the car by moonlight. He said he thought it might help him to sleep. And after that he went out with Marlowe? Yes. Oh, I, I supposed he would be quite late, so before long I went to bed. And you were asleep when he came back later? Yes, but not too soundly. Do you remember what he said? Not clearly. I, I was still half asleep, but he did say he changed his mind about going for a drive. Did he say why? Yes. He said that he'd sent Mr. Marlowe to Southampton on a business errand to get a message from a man who was sailing for Paris. He said that he had ridden in the car for a short way and then walked home. Did he say anything more? No, not that I remember. I, I recall the light was turned out in a few minutes and I went to sleep again. And you didn't hear anything that night? No. I didn't awake until my maid brought the morning tea at seven o'clock. She closed the door to my husband's room, as she always did, and I supposed him to be there sleeping until I heard his body had been found. Thank you, Mrs. Benderson. Now I believe I'd better find Mr. Marlowe. I missed him yesterday, and I'd like to talk with him before everyone goes to the inquest. Very well, Mr. Trent. If there's any way I can help, please call on me whenever you wish. I must say, Trent... I can imagine one's wife being a little more broken up after one's murder. No one seemed to be terribly broken up about Mendelssohn, Welby. When I found Marlowe in the library, he seemed a bit tired and pale, but hardly grief-stricken. I rather liked the chap, but I didn't have time to waste in friendly conversation. I'm sorry I missed you yesterday, Mr. Trent. We've been deuced to busy, you know, trying to straighten out all the affairs. That's quite all right, Marlowe. Before you go to the inquest, I'd just like to ask you a few things about your trip to Southampton. It, uh... It certainly was extraordinary the way Manderson sent you off in the middle of the night like that. Well, not really, if you're new, Manderson. He rather liked to do things dramatically that way. He was always making sudden decisions. Just uh, what was it you were supposed to do in Southampton? Oh, well, I was supposed to meet George Harris, who was sailing for Paris. I, I suppose it was something too secret for a telegram, so he sent me. Who was Harris? I never heard of him before. Nor did Bunner. You're sure you don't know what the business was about? No, I know nothing at all about it. As it turned out, Harris didn't arrive, so I returned. Uh, there's uh, one other thing I'd like to be sure about, Marlowe. Manderson told you to drive to Southampton on this errand before he told Mrs. Manderson that you were taking him for a moonlight drive. Is that right? Yes, this was before we returned to the house. As I understand it, he then told both Mrs. Manderson and Martin that I, I had persuaded him to go for a drive in the moonlight. <laughs> of course, you understand what I'm getting at. Oh. Why did he want to conceal your own that way? Well, I can't even make a guess, Mr. Trent. Well, perhaps we'll find out later. Oh, there's one other thing, Marlowe. I've two slips of paper here I want you to look at. Oh. Go ahead, take them. Examine them closely. Uh, well, I guess they're just blank pieces of paper, as far as I can see. Have you any idea where they came from, Mr. Marlowe? No. Oh, but this is one here. It has a date on it. Yes? Yes, it looks as if it had been cut out of a, a diary. Yes, but feel the quality of the paper. Do you think you could identify another piece of paper of the same kind? Oh, oh, I'm afraid I'm not much of an expert at that sort of thing, Mr. Trent. Oh, well, that's not important. Here, I'll take them back now. I suppose it's nearly time for you to be going to the inquest. Why, yes, I'd better find Mrs. Manderson and the others. Are you coming with us, Mr. Trent? No, not just yet. I, I have a few things to do here at the house first. For the rest of you, go ahead. I may be along later. <laughs>
Trent. That story of Marlowe's errand certainly sounded strange. Yes, but it all checked, Welby. Yes, that's right. But I'm surprised you didn't want to go to the inquest, old boy. Sounds a bit negligent, you know. I had more important things to do, Welby. Among other things, I wanted to take some pictures with my camera. What on earth did you want to take pictures for? You'll see what I mean, Welby. By that evening, I had my work nearly completed. When couples came into my room at the hotel... Oh, I'm very sorry, my boy. You seem to be quite busy. Perhaps I shouldn't interrupt you. It's quite all right, couples. Perhaps you can give me a hand. Uh, whatever it is you're doing, I'm afraid I don't understand it. Well, this, it looks like a regular laboratory. Well, just been developing a few photographs. How did everything go at the inquest? Well, nothing very surprising developed. But I'm afraid Mabel had a hard time of it. They insisted on questioning her about the strained relationship with her husband. She managed herself very well. She's a remarkable woman, couple. I only wish... Oh, no, it's no use wishing. What did they decide? I believe they were impressed by Mr. Bunner's theory of some, some sort of labor revenge. Brought a charge against a person or persons unknown. Oh, well, that was to be expected, I suppose. Now I'll show you some of the secrets of my craft. Uh-huh. We have several interesting objects here. First, this glass bowl. It happens to be the one Manderson kept his dental plate in by the side of his bed. Uh-huh. Now, hand me that bottle, Couples. Uh, uh, this one, you mean? Right. Uh-huh. We have here some grey powder, mercury and chalk. Now, I want you to pour a little of the powder on the bowl. Uh, in uh, this fashion, do you mean? Excellent. Now, I brush the powdered part of the bowl... With his camel hair brush. Ah. Now we look again. You see anything? Why, yes. That's most extraordinary. There are two large gray finger marks on the bowl. Now watch closely. I have here a photograph of some fingerprints I found on the inside of the French window in Mrs. Madison's bedroom. If you examine them closely, you'll find that they match perfectly. Hmm. The bowl in Madison's room and is... The window in Mrs. Manderson's room. Whose fingerprints are they, my boy? I suppose Manderson's? We'll know in a moment. I have here two bits of paper cut from my diary. When I shake this powder on the paper, I believe it will bring out another set of fingerprints. Yes. (laughs) Yes, again, there's no question about it. All three prints were made by the same man. On the bowl, on the French window, on this slip of paper. I don't know much about this fingerprint business, Trent. What conclusion does this bring you? Uh, I'm sorry, Couples. When I started this business, I meant to take it with me every step of the way. But now that I've found out what I have, I'm going to have to keep it to myself, at least for the time being. I hope you don't mind. I don't know what to make of all this, my boy, but well, I must trust to your discretion completely. I say, Trent, old man, it was Marlowe who made the fingerprints in those pages from your diary. He must have made the others as well, but how? I mean, after all... We'll come to that, Welby. But I want to tell you the story just as it happened to me. I don't see how you ever suspected. Why, it's fantastic. Oh, I was performing brilliantly, no doubt about that. That night I sat up writing a report of the case. A brilliant report which has never been published. Surely, if you knew the facts, why, you had to report them, old boy. Not necessarily, Welby. There are some directions in which I decline to assist the police. The next morning I went to White Gables and insisted on seeing Mrs. Manderson. When I entered, she looked up, surprised. Oh, you look terribly tired, Mr. Trent. Can I get you anything? No, thank you, Mrs. Manderson. Let me come right to the point. Oh, of course. But please do sit down, won't you? I, I, I want to catch a train at noon, but I can't go till I have this thing settled. I'll tell you anything I can. I know you won't make it worse for me than you can help. I have here my report on your husband's death. I need to know some things that only you can tell me before I decide whether or not to publish this report. It it suggests a possibility that may or may not be imaginary on my part. If it is not imaginary, then, as a gentleman who wishes you well, 
regardless of all else. I shall not publish this. I don't know what you've discovered or what you may be imagining, Mr. Trent, but it is very good of you to come to me about it. Please believe me, this is the, the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. I've read the record of the inquest, and you said you did not know why your husband changed his attitude towards you in the last months of his life. Is that true? Just a moment, Mr. Trent. Do you realize what you're asking? Yes, I believe I do. You're asking me if I perjured myself on the witness stand. Yes, that's correct. I didn't come here to preserve the polite fictions, Mrs. Manderson. And the idea that a reputable person never withholds part of the truth under any circumstances is merely a polite fiction. I see. Very well. I, I know you must have a good reason for asking what you do. I'll have to try to explain something about my marriage. It wasn't a, a very successful one. I was only 20 at the time and rather alone in the world. My husband was 20 years older than I, and he seemed so strong, sure of himself. But I soon found he cared more for his business than he ever could for me. Go on. Yes. I... My husband wanted someone to, to take a place in society, to, to do him credit, to make a great social success. But I, I couldn't do that. I, I found the whole world of luxury and wealth empty and dull. It, it was useless to me. Oh, I, I tried to live up to his ideas about social success. After all, I'd made a bargain, but it became harder every year. At last, of course, he realized that. He could see through anything, I think, once his attention was turned to it. I suppose it hurt him and made him bitter, but there was nothing I could do. After a time, we were just being polite to each other. It was like that for months before he died. Now you know what I, I never wanted to admit to anyone. Is that all you want to know? No. I'm sorry, but there's one more thing. One thing more that's the whole point of my inquiry. What is it, then? What is it? I must ask you this. Will you assure me your husband's change towards you had, had nothing to do with John Marlowe? With John Marlowe? Oh, no. Oh, no. No, you can't, you... No, no, please. I'll leave my report with you, Mr. Oh, Anderson. No, no, no. It's the only copy, I assure you. And no one else will ever know what it contains. is terribly confusing. Did you think that perhaps Mrs. Manderson and Marlowe... I mean, uh, just what did you think, old boy? Well, just for the moment, we'll forget what I thought. And I'll tell you what I knew. Of course, I knew from the fingerprints that Marlowe had been in Manderson's room, where he had no business, and also in Mrs. Manderson's room. Or even less. Knowing that, I had to construct what had happened. Mm. I told you Manderson's patent leather shoes had been ripped slightly just below the basing. Ripped as though they had been worn by someone for whom they were too small. Well, in that case, if someone else had worn Manderson's shoes, that footprint made so clearly outside the library window had been made by someone else. That brought me to the idea that it was not Manderson who returned to the house that night after he left in the car. Not Manderson, but he was seen by the butler and went up to bed and spoke to his wife. Yes, yes, but, but the butler saw only the man by the telephone. He didn't see his face. And Mrs. Manderson only spoke to him. She didn't see him at all. No, it was not Manderson who returned, but someone who wanted people to think that Manderson was in the house that night. Perhaps so, old boy, but, but really, you know... It, it had to be someone who knew Manderson well, who could imitate him, and who knew the ways of the household perfectly. The most interesting thing this false Manderson did was tell Martin he had sent Marlowe to Southampton. It wasn't Manderson's way to confide to a butler. He also told Mrs. Manderson he had sent Marlowe to Southampton. It wasn't Manderson's way to speak of business to Mrs. Manderson. Why did he mention Marlowe? 
it occurred to me it might be because he was Marlowe himself. Oh, yes, that, that seems reasonable. Remember that picture in his room? That's right. Marlowe had been an amateur actor at Oxford, and I specialized in impersonations. What's more, when I measured his shoes, I found them one size larger than Mendelssohn's. And don't forget, he had the same kind of gun with which Mendelssohn was shot. Yes, when he returned as Mendelssohn, he also cleaned and put the gun back in his room. I say, that was a brilliant piece of work, Trent. <laughs> now, the way I saw it, Marlowe went off with Mendelssohn in the car. He shot him some distance from the house so he wouldn't be heard. He took the body to the place where it was found, took off the outer clothes and the dental plate, went back to the house and entered through the window. He told Martin he'd sent Marlowe to Southampton and told Martin to stay up until 12.30. That was to establish his alibi. After all, if Mendelssohn were thought to be still alive at 12.30 and Marlowe arrived in Southampton by 6.30, no one could suspect him of murder. Of course not. He wouldn't have had time to drive from Marlton to Southampton. However, if he could get away by midnight, he could still make the run. When Martin left, he went to Manderson's room, spoke to Mrs. Manderson, rumpled the bed as if Manderson had slept in it, put away the clothes he brought with him, and then took other clothes with which to dress Manderson's body after he left. Hmm. That's why Manderson's shirt hadn't been changed and why the shoes were tied loosely. I suppose it is simple when you know. But why did Marlowe murder Manderson? That part I didn't know. But of course there was Mrs. Manderson. More than one man has killed for a woman. I suppose it's your affair, but I still can't see why you suppressed your report. Why you turned it over to Mrs. Manderson. After all, you'd only met her a couple of times. And, and in those couple of times, I, I'd fallen hopelessly, desperately in love with her. I, I could do nothing to hurt Mabel, even if she were protecting the man who murdered her husband. Even if he were her lover. Good heavens. So your brilliant report went for nothing. <laughs> My report? Brilliant? Possibly. Accurate? Not Quite. Good heavens, what do you mean? Tell me, Welby, what do you suppose Mabel did after the excitement died down? Hmm, I suppose she went off with Marlowe. That's what I suppose for a full year. Until I heard that Marlowe was married to a pretty Irish girl. Oh, I say. And did you see Mabel, I mean, Mrs. Madison again? Oh, yes. Quite by design, at Couples' home one night. After dinner, Couples left us alone. And pretty soon, she brought the subject up. Mr. Trent... I've told myself it didn't matter what you thought of me in the affair of my husband's death, but it does matter. I want you to understand. You see, what you thought was not true. Uh, I've stopped thinking. But I want you to know what was true. First, my husband was insanely jealous of John Marlowe. And when you practically asked me if my husband's secretary was my lover, I, I broke down and made a scene. You thought that was a confession. Perhaps you even thought I had a part in the crime. Go ahead, please. I read your report over and over again. In fact, I have it here. What you didn't know is something I have never told anyone. Mr. Marlowe and I were... I admired him very much. He was like a member of the household... One day, my husband asked me what I thought was the best thing about Marlowe, and without thinking, I said, his manners. He's a perfect gentleman. For some reason, my husband seemed to resent that very much, and later on, it came to me he may have felt that he himself wasn't quite a gentleman, and in spite of his money and power, never could be. As I look back upon it now, I, I think that was the beginning. And uh, after that, your husband grew more and more jealous? Yes. That was the one weakness in his character. After that, he misunderstood every word and look, I suppose. Later on, Mr. Marlowe became engaged to an American girl. A rather selfish little flirt. And, and one morning, he seemed quite upset at breakfast. So afterwards, I went to the room where he was working to see if he were ill. He handed me a note she had written breaking their engagement. Of course, I, I felt sorry for him, and I, I remember I put my hand on his shoulder just as my husband came in. He glanced at it, turned and walked out again. It was some time later that I realized what the situation was. Oh. Did, uh, did Marlowe suspect your husband's feelings? Oh, no. No, I, I'm sure he didn't. However, I, I tried to act as though nothing had changed, but 
He grew more and more distant and aloof. No, I, I've really told you everything. I, I, I can't tell you how, how sorry I am for my own suspicions. Really, Mr. Trent, you were perfectly reasonable in your opinions. After all, you met me only twice in your life. Just, just one more thing. Why didn't you turn the information over to the authorities? Because it seemed to me very likely those facts would be fatal to Mr. Marlowe. Well, I dare say they would be. Well, that being the case, I, I was certainly not going to expose Mr. Marlowe to that danger when I knew he was innocent. You knew he was innocent? You mean he constructed an alibi for himself for a crime he didn't commit? I simply knew Mr. Marlowe was incapable of killing anyone. I don't know what part he played in the events that night, but anyone knowing Mr. Marlowe could be sure he couldn't possibly take a man's life. I say, Trent, you were a bit too suspicious about Mrs. Manderson, weren't you? Uh, I suppose so, but huh, what else could I think at the time? At any rate, I went immediately and talked the whole thing out with couples. He knew where Marlowe was staying. I wrote to him, sending him a copy of my report. I told him if he'd any correction to make, I expected to hear from him. Otherwise, I would turn the report over to the authorities. A few days later, couples and I received an invitation to Marlowe's office. We found him alone. Mr. Trent, would you tell me, does anyone else know of this report? Only three people besides yourself, Marla. Mrs. Manderson has read it, and I've discussed it with Mr. Couples. Yes, yes, I read it only a few days ago. Found it fascinating. Simply fascinating. You see, I, I, I wanted Couples to be present to, to witness your explanation. Very well. I have read your report several times, and I must say I don't believe that any other man could have obtained as much of the truth as you have. Then there is more to the truth, Marla? Oh, yes, a great deal more. Although I... I never supposed that I would tell it until now. Well, uh, let, me, let me tell you beforehand that although I'm here to listen to you, so far I've no reason to doubt my report. I want you to understand that as far as I'm concerned, you'll be making a defense. A defense of suspicion of murder. Naturally. And here it is. As you may know, Manderson was not a man of normal mind. Now, I never knew that myself until the last night of his life. That's when I learned that because of some delusion, he had an unreasonable hatred for me. To what did you attribute this hatred? I didn't know, and I haven't the slightest idea. Oh, come on, my dear fellow. Surely there must have been some reason. Perhaps a madman doesn't need a reason. And Manderson was sufficiently mad to kill himself in order to doom someone he hated. You, you mean to say that Manderson committed suicide? Yes, that is what I mean. Oh, dear me, I'm, I'm afraid that statement calls for elucidation. Uh, suppose you tell us the facts of that night, Marlowe. Anyway, after dinner, Manderson wanted to talk with me, and we strolled out to the garden. He said he had a very important and confidential errand to be done. I believe you told us something of this before. Yes, but not quite all of it. He told me I was to take a briefcase to Southampton and give it to a man named George Harris. And he said that if Harris failed to arrive, I was to take the boat to Paris, traveling under Harris's name and taking the briefcase with me. And what were you supposed to do in Paris, Marlowe? I was to go to the Hotel St. Petersburg and stay there under the name of Harris until someone contacted me. I must say that was a strange assignment. Yes, but it was Manderson's way, and I didn't want to let him down. I'll confess I didn't like all the mystery. Hmm. Yeah. After this conversation on the lawn, what did you do? Well, I changed clothes, I packed a few things, brought the car around from the garage, and met him in the library. He gave me a locked briefcase, and then... Since I only had a few shillings in my pocket, I asked him for some money for expenses. It was then that the first odd thing happened. Manderson reached for his billfold, where he always kept about a hundred pounds. Then he suddenly stopped, and I saw his face go white with anger. He told me to wait in the car, and he would get some money. Now, that seemed terribly strange, because the week before, I had drawn a thousand pounds for him from his London bankers, and I knew that that money was locked in his desk. But instead of going to the desk, he went to the drawing room. I went out to the car. After a moment, through the open drawing room window, I heard Mrs. Manderson say, I have only about 30 pounds. Will that be enough? Well, I didn't hear the answer, but uh, after a moment, I heard him say, I'm going out now. Marlowe has persuaded me to go for a drive in the moonlight. 
Perhaps it will help him sleep. He hadn't said anything about this to you before. Oh, no, certainly not. I couldn't understand his telling a lie, but a moment later he came out, handed me some money, said that he would ride with me for a way, and we started off. Why, this is most mysterious, I'd say. Please, couples. Uh, Go ahead, Mara. Well, I drove along in a daze. I knew that something was wrong. And after a mile, he told me to stop and he got out. When I started off again, I glanced into the rearview mirror and caught a glimpse of Manderson's face in the moonlight. He was looking after me with sheer madness written on his face. As I drove off, I saw him shake his fist at me. Oh, I'm sure you're telling the truth, young man, but it, it hardly seems credible. Go on, Mother. Well, when I got around a turn in the road, I stopped. I knew suddenly that this man hated me insanely. He had lied about my saying I persuaded him to go for a moonlight drive, and he was sending me on a wild trip to Paris. The question kept coming back. Where are those thousand pounds? And then all of a sudden it hit me. The thousand pounds were right there with me. I broke open the lock of the briefcase, and there was the money along with Manderson's billfold. The whole thing came to me in a flash. With Manderson's money on me, it would seem that I robbed him and had gone to Paris under an assumed name. This is fantastic, Marlowe. What happened? Well, I decided the only thing to do was to turn around, overtake Manderson before he got back to the house and call the police and have it out of him. I turned around and I started back fast when I heard the sound of a gunshot. I stopped. I got out and I saw Manderson's body lying on the golf course. I saw at once that he was dead. Then I picked up a revolver at his feet and I saw that it was mine. Now it was look as if I had not only robbed but murdered him. Over and over, I found myself remembering what Manderson had said at the house. Marlowe has persuaded me to go for a moonlight drive. That was going to be my death sentence. I found myself repeating it aloud. And then it struck me that I was saying it in Manderson's own voice. That's what gave you the idea of impersonating Manderson. Yes, that's right. Well, I put the body in the car and I drove back to the house and left it on the lawn. I put on Manderson's hat and jacket and shoes and made a clear footprint in the gravel outside the open library window. When I went in, I put the money back in his desk, called Martin, kept my back to him while I pretended to telephone. I told him that I had sent Marlowe to Southampton. Then I went to Manderson's room, put his things away, put his dental plate in the glass beside the table, and when Mrs. Manderson spoke from the next room, I answered in her husband's voice. And when I was sure she was asleep again, I took clothes to redress the body, sneaked across her room and out of the French window. Afterwards, I drove to Southampton as fast as I could. Oh, now I think I told you everything. Is there any cross-examination? No. Just let me have that report of mine there. We'll burn it in the fireplace. If I may say so, you acted like a lunatic. That's what threw me off. But I'll admit if you'd acted like a sane man, no one would have believed you. You'd probably have been hanged. There's one small question I'd like to ask out of curiosity, Marlowe. Suppose someone else had been suspected of the crime and been put on trial. What would you... I would have felt it my duty to go with my story to the lawyers for the defense and put myself in their hands. Ah. Fortunately, it hasn't come to that. and never will. I looked up Inspector Murch at Scotland Yard. And they agree with Bunner's story. This was a case of revenge by some black hand gang. So, that's the end of the Manderson case. <laughs> Word, Trent, old boy. It must have come as a bit of a shock to you, eh? Yes, well, be. It seemed that I had perhaps been a bit too clever. But after all, you did get to the truth of the matter. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I took old couples out to celebrate with a bottle of wine. Well, congratulations, dear boy. I can't tell you how happy I am that the Manderson mystery is disposed of. <laughs> Didn't you find Marlowe extraordinarily ingenious? Ingenious? Oh, yes, yes, to be sure, but scarcely extraordinary, my dear boy. But couples, surely you must have been surprised by Marlowe's story. Oh, I will admit it had unusual features in respect to its details. But you see, I was always certain Marlowe was innocent. Do you mean that all the time I was working on the case at Marlowe's and you knew Marlowe was innocent? Why, yes, it's all very simple. You see, I shot Manderson. Oh, I, I say, I'm sorry, Trent. I, I'm afraid I made you spill your wine. Uh, I... <laughs> ne- 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 never mind. Ne- never mind the wine. Go on. 
Well, you see, uh, the Sunday night Manderson was killed... I took my usual bedtime walk and went across the golf course to the road that runs behind White Gables. I meant to walk down the road for a way, but I saw a car approach and stop. When I saw Manderson get out in the moonlight, I, I didn't want to meet him, so I stepped back into the shadows. I overheard him talking with Marlowe, and when the car moved away, I saw him shake his fist after it most violently. Yes, Cuffles. And then? Then I saw him walk over the turf to the green and draw a pistol, which he aimed at his breast. He didn't see you, I suppose. No, 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 no. I was hidden. But I saw that terrible look on his face, and I knew he was quite overwrought. Uh, incidentally, if I may remark on a theory of my own... Yes, uh, yes, couples, by all means, too. Well, it, it's my thought Manderson did not intend to kill himself but only to wound himself and charge Marlowe with attempted murder and robbery. However, at the moment, I assumed it was suicide. And to spare my niece from such a scandal, I jumped from the shadows and seized his arm to wrest the gun away from him. But he leapt at me. I knew it was my life or his, so I fired blindly into his face. I threw down the pistol, bent over him, saw that he was dead. When I heard the car return, I hid in the shadows again and waited until Marlowe finally lifted the body into the car. I assumed that Marlowe would simply tell everyone how he'd found the body and that he and everyone else would assume it was suicide. Yes, I suppose that seemed reasonable at the time. However, my dear boy, I realized that my position was a delicate one, since I'd quarreled with Madison in public that morning. I thought it'd be best if people felt that I'd been at my hotel all the time, so I... Hurried back, looked through the rear window, saw there was no one in the writing room. I climbed over the sill, rang the bell for the waiter. Then I sat down and began to write a letter. When the waiter came, I asked for a glass of milk and a postage stamp. Soon afterwards, uh, I went up to bed. Somehow I couldn't sleep well. Really, couples? What was the matter? I don't really know, but I, I was annoyed about it because... I knew that next day would be a trying one, and I wanted to be at my best. You know, at my age, one needs a good deal of sleep. I'm not as young as I used to be. No. I guess none of us is. I, I know, I, I, I feel considerably older than I ever did before. In fact, let's drink a toast again. This one to Trent's last case. As for you, couples, I shall now expect you to pay for the wine. The curtain falls on another production of the NBC University Theater. This has been an adaptation of Trent's Last Case by E.C. Bentley. Our star today, Mr. Dan O'Herlihy. This is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site. We stream live OTR Westerns 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, along with putting out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, I hope you enjoyed this um, mystery. It's a very uh, classic story. I have to admit that I was incredibly surprised when it turned out that couples had actually do, done the killing. Though, as we heard from, for justifiable reasons, one big difference 
between this radio adaptation and the novel is that at the end of the novel, he was set to marry the widow. He did marry her, and this was uh, shown in his sequel novel, Trent's Own Case, as well as Trent Intervenes, although these two books came more than 20 years after the previous one. This also, uh, the story influenced other uh, mystery writers. It certainly reflected in the uh, Candy Matson case, which was entitled Candy's Last Case, and I was glad to bring it to you in celebration of 2,000 episodes. Again, thank you so much to everyone who has uh, supported and listened to the pro 